once you learn how to combine two pinch pads into a closed form, you have a very versatile building block. This building block can become the body for many functional and sculptural forms. Add a foot and a neck and you have a vase. Add a spout and a handle and a lid and you have a teapot. Add an animal head and you have a sculpture. Add a handle to the sculpture and you can suspend it in the air. You can carve into it to let the light through. The possibilities are endless. The best way to start is to collect your ideas and inspirations in one place. Most of the times, sketchbook is where artists begin developing their ideas for 3D projects. However, it doesn't have to be the case. You can collect objects and textures you might want to reproduce in clay. Usually, a combination of drawings and 3D examples is the best. The drawing doesn't have to be elaborate. You can lay down some rudimentary ideas about the shape you want to develop. Something like, does it have a foot? Does it have a handle? It is much quicker to try those simple additions to your plant form on paper before you begin construction. In this video, I will show you how to make a closed form from two pinch pods and how to imitate the aesthetics of your chosen object into your work. There is intimacy and creativity in a pinched project that is unmatched. Created from a single lump of clay, pinched pots have the direct imprint of the artist's fingers and thumbs. A pinch pot is a small vessel you can create with just your hands. The act of making one can help you understand the consistency of clay and how to control it. The pinching technique is simple, but can be very effective to bring out a unique body of work that you can truly be proud of. There are no two pinch pods that are the same. You have already tried making a pinch pod. In the last video, I showed you how to take a slow approach to pinch pod making. However, there are many ways to stretch clay. Here you see me taking a more aggressive approach. Once pitch pot is large enough to fit over your fist, you can stretch it by hitting it in a slant down motion. Regardless of how you stretch your clay, if you made enough pinch pots, you know how easy it is to create a hole in the wall of the pot. This happens all the time, and learning how to patch your pot is very similar to how you would make an addition to your piece. Here I have a hole I need to patch, so I scratch and slip and add very fresh clay right out of the bag, which is moist, trying not to create any air bubbles. I support it from the inside as well, and then I can smooth it out and blend it into the wall. To connect two pinch pots together, you need an even rim, so cut the organic parts of the rim to make it even and consistent. I'm done with one pinch pot. Now I'm making its counterpart. I'm trying to match the second pinch pot to the first one. It should be very similar in volume and rims should have the same diameter. The rims of two pinch pots should line up, so if they don't, keep working to make sure that they're the same diameter. At this stage, clay is very soft and wobbly, so handle it with care and not to deform it too much. If you are struggling to maintain their shapes, you can stuff both of them with crumbled newspaper to prevent them from caving in. This is particularly important when you're trying to connect two together. It's okay to leave the newspaper inside. It will burn out in a kiln. Now, let both of them dry to leather hard. Do not skip this step. Both pinch pods should hold their shape before you connect them together. As we already know, to connect a piece of clay to another piece of clay, you need to scratch and slip. That's what I did on both sides, on both rims of pinch pods. This is the trickiest part in making a closed form, because the form wants to cave in when you connect the two together. 
That's why it's really important that your pinch pads are at leather hard state. If you are struggling, then once again, you can stuff this form with crumbled newspaper. This will prevent it from caving in. Two forms will not connect perfectly together. Try the best you can and then roll a small coil out of the fresh clay. Scratch and slip the seam and place the coil right on top of that seam. Use the rib to smooth it out and blend the coil into the form. You can always use smooth plastic like a credit card. Credit cards work well to smooth out leather hard clay. Keep attaching the coil all around the form and smoothen it out till you see no seam. At this stage, the clay is still soft enough to be shaped in what you want it to be. So you can tap or roll and modify the sphere. When you're done, wrap it in plastic and let it dry a bit so all clay is consistently the same state. Slow drying is always best for clay. Potters use many analogies to human body when describing vessels. The vase, for example, has a lip, neck, handle, shoulder, body, and a foot. The closed form we just made is the body. The object, which qualities I chose to mimic, is a chewing gum. Now I need to decide how to translate its look or material quality onto my vase. First, let's talk a little about three-dimensional aesthetics. Sculpture is a distinctive art form because it is directed towards and appreciated by the sense of touch rather than vision. Even if you don't actually touch the object, your brain provides you with distinctive three-dimensional concepts such as mass, weight, solidity, depth and volume, and texture. The visual experience is correlated with the prior tactile understanding. And this is what you need to tap into when trying to mimic and translate qualities of something in particular into your work. Now back to construction. You already know how to make a foot, make a band, and then scratch and slip, attach this band to the body of the vessel, and then roll a small tiny coil and smooth it out right into the seam to make sure that the foot is well attached. When this step is complete, let this form dry so you can turn the form onto the foot, which should be leather hard before you do that. Now the foot should be dry enough to place it on a table and then work on a neck. I'm trying to decide where to place the neck of the vase. I don't want it to be super symmetrical since I'm trying to work with the concept of the chewing gum, which is very malleable. Now let's make the neck for our vase. Using the wire tool, cut a block of clay out of the bag, which is about two inches thick and the length of the neck that you want your vase to have. Tap on all corners to smooth them out and roll the coil. Now you need to hollow this coil out using a dowel or a pencil. Insert it inside the coil 
and then slowly roll back and forth. Check from time to time the thickness of the wall. If one side is getting thinner, stop rolling in that place and roll only on the thick side. To taper it a little, roll it in a circular motion. This method works well for making necks of vases or spouts for teapots. Decide which side is the lip of the vase and attend to it. Smooth it out. You can pinch it out just a little bit to change the form to make it look like a lip. Place the neck on the form and outline it. Then carve the hole inside that outline, taking in consideration the thickness of the neck. Then blend the clay really well so you see no seam. If the neck caves in, support it with a dowel from the inside. Now let's move on to the handle. The size of the coil for the handle should correspond to the size of the piece you're making the handle for. If you want your handle to have nice consistent groove, wet your fingers, place your index finger in the center of the coil, thumb on one side and the middle finger on the other, and consistently move your wet fingers up and down and the clay will repeat the groove that you form with your fingers. Don't think too much about classical attachment of the handle. Attach it the way you think works with your concept. A lot of times, both sides of the handle need to be cut under the angle that works for the curve of your form. At this stage, you attach an soft clay to leather hard body. The handle is soft and may not keep its shape. You can use external support to prevent handle from sagging. The external support can be just pieces of clay or bunched up newspaper. Here you see me add an extra foot. My vase is a little too wonky, so I want to provide it an extra support. I can incorporate this foot into my design. By now the handle is dry enough to hold its own shape, so I am removing external support. Keeping an image in mind I've chosen for the theme, my goal now is to connect the handle and the foot in a way as if it's been stuck on top of the vase. I'm attempting an optical illusion. Rather than placing one sheet on top of the vase, which will trap a lot of air, I'm rolling one thin coil and smoothing it only on one side. This provides an illusion as if something is covering the form. Let's look at the anatomy of the teapot. Many things you already know how to make. The body, the handle, and the spout. Now we need to learn how to make a lid. 
Here's the teapot I made earlier to match the aesthetics of the vase. It has a spout which you would cut under an angle to connect to the teapot. The same type of handle as the vase and I pinched out feet which are purely for decoration. The simplest way to make a lid is to cut it out of your form under a 45 degree angle. Then all you need to do is just to add a knob. As you can see here, this is not what I did. I cut straight down. So now I need to add an extra step. Let's take a look at this diagram. To prevent the lid from falling through, you need a gallery. Gallery is the name of the extension off of the wall of the teapot to prevent the lid from falling through. I'm rolling a small coil and attaching it halfway down the opening of the teapot. Remember to always scratch and slip. Now the knob. The knob is an important element of the lid. While making the knob, you have yet another opportunity to add a decorative element that matches the overall aesthetics of the piece. If the knob you added adds a lot of clay on top of your lid, carve some clay out to make sure that it's not too thick. This will help with drying, which prevents exploding in the kiln, and also lighten, lightens the lid. And now on to painting. Remember to paint two layers of underglaze and let it dry in between. Also think how to apply the color so it enhances the theme that you chose for your pieces.
Instead of a table vase, you can make wall vase or a wall sculpture. Two pinch parts attached together create a building block, out of which then you can make anything you'd like. This is just the body, which can literally be the body. It can be the body of a human or an animal. The three main things to keep in mind when building a wall sculpture. Every time you add to the clay, scratch and slip. If you make in a wall piece, one side should be flatter, so you can flatten it with a wooden spoon by lightly tapping on one side consistently. If you add in something large to your closed form, remember to hollow it out. The thicker the clay is, the more chances you have that it's not going to dry all the way through and it will explode in the kiln. If you hollow it out, you facilitate faster drying. When you attach it after you hollow out, remember to carve the hole between the main closed form and the hollowed little form. If you don't do that, then the air will be trapped in a smaller piece that you just carved up. And finally, before you complete your sculpture, make sure you carve the hole on the back 
to be able to hang it and to let the air out. I've chosen birch tree for the theme of my wall vase. To mimic the texture, I'm going to take an advantage of the texture that the wooden spoon gives me while I tap on the form. So instead of hiding those marks, I emphasize them. Wall vases are perfect for practicing attaching spouts to a teapot. Because every time you want to attach a neck to a wall vase, you have to cut this neck under an angle. 